Hello, everybody. The Hockey News Podcast is back. And A-Squad is back, assuming yeah. you still consider myself, Matt Larkin, Ryan Kennedy, and Ken Campbell the A-Squad, uh, if that's how you view it. Then the A-Squad is back. No Edward Fraser. We'll miss you, Ed. You'll be back at some point, I'm sure. But the original crew is here. And Kenny, uh, how was your 78 weeks of vacation? <laughs> 78 weeks. It was only five, uh, Matt. Oh, and it oh. was wonderful. My wife and I went to England and Scotland, and we had a lovely time. Lots of rain. It only rained. We were in Scotland for three, for two and a half weeks, and it only rained twice, once for... 10 days and once for four days. <laughs> <laughs> I see what it took a second. Yeah. I was like, what? what? Oh, yeah, okay. The gears were turning. All right, Kenny. Well, it's good to have you I back. To, I actually went to the uh, to the arena, the Murfield Arena, where Tony Hand played his hockey. I don't even know if you yeah. guys know who Tony Hand is. I one know the, the name. Greatest, one of the greatest uh, Great Britain players ever. Uh, you know, scored a bunch of points, was drafted by the Edmonton Oilers, came over for a couple camps, never played. But anyways, yeah. So yeah. I was because a friend of mine's uh, son plays for the under. 16 team true story bro true story isn't awesome. steve thomas considered a british export as well he was born there he was born there yeah yeah but i don't know if he would be he played, he's played a, for canada yeah, internationally so, so yeah yeah it's like yeah. owen nolan and ireland right doesn't yeah. really count but okay well kenny uh welcome back and we're going to jump into one more summer version of the all mailbag edition lots of good questions this week lots of humdingers stumpers if you will mm. <laughs> <laughs> i'm feeling goofy today i don't know why <laughs> Uh, so the first one is from Lefty Janimus, who sounds like some, like, I don't know, like a newspaper Lefty reporter. Or, but, or maybe more like a power hitter from, like, 1952. <laughs> Up in the dish now, Lefty Janimus. He's got Rocky Colavito. Yeah, exactly. And Lefty asks, you guys have discussed which coach is on the hot seat, but what about which GM is on the hot seat? Mm-hmm. And that's fair. I feel like coaches get a lot more a lot more play, mm-hmm. but GMs, they get axed as well. So who do you guys well, have? The coaches get a lot more play because it's the GMs who are firing them. Yeah. True. <laughs> yeah. They have, the GMs tend to have longer leashes for sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so who do you guys have as your hot seat GM? We'll start with you, Kenny. Get back in the game. Well, I've got Dale Talon of the Florida Panthers. Um, you know, I mean, he's got his coach. He's got his goalie. They've been they've been underachievers for quite a f- quite a good number of years, and part of the reason is because for whatever reason, the Florida Panthers never know when the season's beginning, and they play terribly for the first two months, and they're out of it by Christmas, and they and, and as as well as they play the rest of the year, they can never claw their way back in. If the Florida Panthers have another terrible start. And Sergei Bobrovsky plays like Sergei Bobrovsky played the first couple of months of last year. I think then you, you know you've got to look at the guy in charge and say, hey, this this you know we've given you everything you want. You can spend to the cap. You got your coach. You got your goalie. You got all the players that you've said you wanted. So, I mean, at some point it's got to come down to the guy putting the roster together. And, and it's funny you mentioned it too because I know I've been very bullish on Florida, having these hunches that they're going to be special this year. But I looked at their schedule, and they play they play uh, I think thirteen games in October, nine around the road. They open the season with a back-to-back against Tampa Bay. Yeah. And Sergei Bobrovsky's worst month of his career, his career splits, is by far October. Yeah. So I'm like, oh my god, the deck is stacked again. <laughs> against them, they're going to be bad in October again. Well, I'm not I'm, I, I'm not picking them to, to make the playoffs because they like I'm tired of that. I'm tired of getting burned by them. Mm-hmm. It was the same thing with the Washington Capitals. I, I stopped picking them to win the Stanley Cup and then just go out and prove me wrong. So, and then they did. Yeah, then they, they did. did. And they did. Yeah. 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 I'm going to go with John Chaika in Arizona. Um, you know, you have a new majority owner coming in. You have a team that hasn't made the playoffs uh, for quite a while now. And, you know, he, he did make some bold moves in the summer, bringing in Phil Kessel. Uh, but what if it doesn't work out? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it will. I think Phil Kessel. I think Phil Kessel is going to be pretty good. I think he's going to be terrific. Yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be a good spot for him. You know, you have a coach in Rick Tockett who is really taken that room and made it his own. And, you know, you could have a potential impact rookie in Barrett Hayton uh, if they need him. And I, I think they might. I think they probably have a spot for him. You know, a great young 200-foot center. Um, but if it doesn't go well, at what point do you have to pull the plug on the John Chaka experiment? And, you know, I, I don't think this is a case of him being on a sizzling hot seat. It's more like a one of those buffet trays. Yeah, hot plate. You know? Yeah, yeah where you're yeah, keeping things like warm. The, it's like in your car in the wintertime when you have heated seats. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, feeling, a he's feeling a little bit of sweat <laughs> underneath. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah so, yeah, but if, if Arizona doesn't make the playoffs yeah. again, 
I, I think you really have to take a long look and say, well, how long do we have to give you? Right. Because it's been since 2011-12, I believe, is the last time we saw the Coyotes in the playoffs, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a good pick. Uh, I'm going to go with Kevin Shebeldayoff in Winnipeg. And mm-hmm. to me, he's a guy who's been pretty untouchable for this recent era of contention. He's done such a good job uh, building the team from within, not being particularly aggressive, chasing big-name free agents. It's been all homegrown guys. But the problem is, I think there's a worry now that maybe Winnipeg missed a crucial window, especially last year. We had them winning mm-hmm, the Cup. Mm-hmm. And now you, you've lost Jacob Truba. You've lost Tyler Myers from that right side of the defense core. Mm-hmm. And you have questions now about, you know, is Patrick Line going to sign? Are they going to lose Patrick Line? And if you have to trade Patrick Line or he gets offer sheeted, or is it, you know, an offer sheet situation? If you don't match, then you're getting futures back. So you're taking a good player out of the lineup. And I think regardless of what happens, the Jets roster is, is worse than last year's. I feel like everyone would agree with that. Just yeah, absolutely. the losses yeah. on the defense yeah. alone. Uh, and and because of cap problems, the Jets were kind of hamstrung. They couldn't do much about it. So I think there's pressure now for results because uh, especially Dustin Bufflin and Blake Wheeler are not getting any younger, as people like to say That's in this true. office. That is a fact. <laughs> uh, and I know the bottom core, the bottom chunk of the core of the Jets roster is still young. But that top part of the core... Uh, is a couple of older veteran leaders, and they don't have that many years left of being great players, Wheeler and Bufflin. They're still in their sort of primes, but they're on their way out just based mm-hmm. on the science of aging. So I think if the Jets, uh, if they miss the playoffs, you never know in the Central these days. Yeah. Or if they bomb out early, I think you have to start wondering if they need a new Shepherd to make roster decisions. Mm-hmm. Fair mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. Next question is from Jordan, we'll say Sladish. Could I be Sladish, so. but I'm going to say Sladish. Okay. And Jordan asks, why... Is Jake Gardner still unsigned, and will he sign before the season begins? Well, one thing I heard, uh, or at least I've read, there, it's been reported by a few different beat writers, no one's saying who, but uh, in the social media world, there's been talk that Gardner has a handshake agreement with a certain team that's waiting to place certain guys on long-term injured reserve, and then they're going to sign him. So who knows if that's true, but it's something to watch for. Mm-hmm. But what do you guys think? I think part of it is the fact that... I, I think... That more and more certainty is an asset in this league. You want certainty in your lineup, right? And this is a guy that is going to command some serious money, and he doesn't bring you that certainty, either in in the form of his health or in the form of you know his his play on the ice. Sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you're never certain which Jake Gardner is yeah. going to show up, right? And and I think, and, but I think the health is, I think the back issues and the health are, are the ones that, that really, I think, would have scared off a lot of teams that might have otherwise been been bullish on this guy. Right. So he might need to do a one-year prove-it deal to show his back <laughs> yeah. is healthy. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, keep in mind, the last time we saw Jake Gardner was in the playoffs for Toronto, and he was a lot more guarded than he usually is because yeah. of the back ailment, and which yeah. is understandable. It, it was good he gritted through it, but he was not the you know wild stallion that he usually is making those rushes up the ice with the puck. Uh, you know He was not using his skating. He was just sort of dumping it out. And ironically, I said this, I think, last week, um, it, it was a much safer Jake Gardner. Yeah. <laughs> it was almost better for the playoffs in that way, but at the same time, it's like if yeah. you're going to be paying him Six million dollars right, a year. Right, say right. that's not what you want. You don't want to stay at home, no, Jake Gardner. No, no because, nobody because needs then, that. Because then all you have to do is sign Dion Phaneuf. Right. If you want yeah. a guy, if you want a guy that's just going to chip it off the glass, <laughs> yeah. That's what that's what Dion Phaneuf became in the last four or five years of his career. Yeah. He was a very highly paid guy who just chipped it off the glass. Yeah. yeah. You can and you didn't can make get plays a, and yeah. and so I mean with Jake Gardner, I mean you want the high end. That, yeah. That, yeah. That's. You know, the, you take the good with the bad with that, but For you totally. want you want the good and you need the good. Yeah. And if you're not going to get that, then he's just an, he's he's a jag. He's just a guy, he's right? Just a guy. Yeah. yeah. And just a guy costs one million dollars. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And it's weird. There are a couple of rumors that I don't really understand. One is the idea of Gardner coming back to play for the Leafs on a one one year minimum deal or minimum salary deal or like you know let's say a million dollars whatever it's going to be but I don't understand it just from a roster construction standpoint because the Leafs on the left side you've already got Riley you've got Muzzin once Dermot is healthy you have Dermot and even Rasmus Sandin might be knocking on the door so mm-hmm. if you add Gardner then you're five deep on the left side Right. the only reason to do it would be if Dermot's recovery is going to be a lot longer than expected, and you're mm. you're really certain you're not going to be breaking up Sandine. Fair enough, you sign him for one year. The other team that's been linked to him a lot, another one I don't understand, is Montreal. If Gardner has problems with the emotional pressure of playing in yeah. Toronto, yeah. Montreal is not going to solve that. That's right, because yeah. it's, it's worse there. Yeah, I think it's because even it's worse there. Higher pressure environment. Absolutely, yeah. and it's in and it's in two languages. It's worse right. there. 
Yeah, but he only reads, he only reads one. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. But I think the fan base has a reputation for being even less patient right. with yeah. players who are struggling. So right. I don't know. I don't see that being a fit for him on a personal level, but we'll see. Uh, next question is from Jeff Putnam at Pusky Putsky eighty eight. Mm. Which rookie will surprise everyone this season, and which rookie will disappoint versus expectations? We'll start with prospect boy Ryan Kennedy. Okay, yes. Uh, so for the rookie that will surprise the season, I'm going with Dennis Gurianoff of the Dallas Stars. I had a chance to talk with AHL Texas coach Derek Laxdahl this summer, and I was asking him because it's been quite a while since Dennis Gurianoff was drafted in the first round by mm-hmm. Dallas, but he was saying that. You know, uh, a lot of maturity has happened in those years. And, you know, Grianov, he's a big guy. He's got a lot of skill, and he's very coachable. So it's taken a while to get him to this point. But, you know, I see a fit on the wing, you know, maybe even in the top six. And that's obviously where Grianov would be uh, the best for Dallas. And if he can seize that opportunity, then all of a sudden, you've got a player that is a bit older than some of the other rookies and has you know, a really nice physical package to him in a good situation. I mean, Dallas is a lot deeper now than they were last season. And if he can fit in on one of those lines, I think he could contribute uh, quite nicely this year. Um, Sticking with Russian rookies, uh, one who might disappoint versus expectations, I would say is Ilya Samsonov. Uh, The goaltender for the Washington Mm -hmm. Capitals has first pro season in North America last year. And, you know, it ended pretty well. He had some ups and downs, but it ended pretty well. My only concern in terms of expectations is how much are you actually going to see Sam Sonoff in the NHL this year. Obviously, you still have Braden Holtby there, uh, and you don't want the kid riding the pine all the time. You'd probably rather see him in Hershey. So I think we'll see some of Sam Sonoff this year, but not that much. And I'm, I don't think he's going to be an impact guy right away because he's still figuring out the North American game. And, you know, the AHL starting to go well for him, but the NHL is another level, another level of shooters. So I think we need to temper expectations right now about him. Right. It's, it's interesting, too, you mentioned Gurionov because I was speaking to Jim Nail, Dallas Stars GM, maybe three or four weeks ago. And I think I was just saying, hey, good job on you know the, getting Pavelski. And then I was saying, you know, he was saying he's excited for next year. And I said, oh, how about Rupe Hints? And then he sort of shifted gears and said, whoa, don't forget about Dennis Gurionov. So go. just mm. a sign that internally they're excited about him. Yeah. And I, I think they're... They've been patient, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're convinced that he's not valuing the Shushkin 2.0. Right. And, I, and I agree, yeah. Kenny, what do you got? Well, uh, I was going to go with a safe pick, but I'm going to go off the board oh, a little all bit. Right. As I am calling an audible do, at the line I of scrimmage. And I am going to go with Uh-oh. Alex Barre Boulet. Oh, oh. Wow. thank you. He's your, your new, he's your new Yanni Gord. He's my new Gord. Yanni Gord. Yeah, yeah he's the, my new. He's going to be my new man crush. There you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, rookie of the year in the American League last year, and Tampa has always, you know, from Tyler Johnson to Andre Pilat to uh, to Yanni Gord, they've always had it had a, 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 a reputation or, or at least have been known for being able, you know, being willing to give guys like this a chance. And I mean, right now their lineup is really stacked, but who knows, maybe an injury early in the year, he comes in, he plays himself, you know, onto the team and plays himself into a top, you know, top nine role. Um, so there's a guy that, you know, another undersized free agent guy who's going to come in and do great things on a great mm. team, in my opinion. That's fun. Possibly. So there's, there's like my it. guy. And what's interesting too is, is Tampa, the farm system, also has the leading scorer in the AHL. Carter, Carter. Ray, I'm Ray. glad you said his name. I was like, yeah, I've never said Carter his name aloud. Verhaeg. So there's another guy that could be a hidden gem. Exactly. And I'm not going to call this guy a disappointment, but I, I'm looking at a guy like Cody Glass with the Vegas Golden Knights, and everything about Vegas is about merit. Everything about Vegas is about being ready. Everything about Vegas is being able to contribute. And they are, you know, they're a pretty stacked, deep lineup. And I think, you know, I I don't think it would be the worst thing in the world for Cody Glass to, you know, play a year in the American League and, you know, sort of get grounded in reality in that respect and then make his way up the the, the chain. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people are expecting him to step in this year and be an impact player. I'm not so sure. And and that's that is in no way an indictment of Cody Glass, because I think, you know, last year he proved 
proved how elite he can be. But I think it's 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 still, you know, I, I think the teams like the Detroits who let their prospects over get over seasoned, yeah. um, you know, ultimately you end up having a lot more success that way. And mm-hmm. I think that that could be the case with Cody Glass. You want a good marinade. Right. That's right. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Good picks. Uh, for my rookie that I'm liking, the sleeper rookie, I'm going to say Drake Batherson in Ottawa. Um, I think last year, you know, he got 20 games in at nine points of 20 games, showed some brief, pretty good chemistry with Matt Duchesne. They sent him down, but I remember being in Ottawa briefly uh, yeah. for an assignment at the time, and Guy Boucher was saying uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a merit decision. It was just to give Batherson more playing time. That was why they sent him back down, and he he lit up the AHL. He was better than a point per game. It yep. almost it seemed easy for him. Mm. Like he is the definition of nothing left to prove at that level. Right. And I think on on Ottawa's depth chart, there is just an easy path to climb. There's not a lot of competition, that, yeah. especially on, if they thing, put him yeah. at right wing. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to be passing guys like Bobby Ryan. I mean, and Ottawa has a lot of forwards that can play either wing. So I think you can find a way to push Batherson up the depth chart, and I think. If it doesn't happen right away, by season's end, he's going to be the first line yeah. right winger. Mm. Uh, and I think he's going to have a breakout season. Uh, really nice scoring touch. And the rookie that I'm kind of, uh, it's funny, he's not even necessarily going to make the team. That's kind of the point I'm making is people seem to be anointing, anointing Adam Fox in New York as, oh, the power play quarterback is going to be right. a breakout. And I think he does have a lot of potential. Um, but it's not like he's Kale McCarr. It's not like Adam Fox was chosen in the top four of the NHL draft and has this absolutely elite pedigree. Good college career, of course. Mm-hmm. Was a good prospect coming up with Calgary. But I, I still think when you have not really been exposed to the pro, the physicality of the pro game, I don't think it's a given that he's just going to jump right into the lineup. I think he could use some more seasoning, especially as a defenseman. So I'm not just going to pencil him in as a top four power play quarterback on the Rangers. So I don't know. I think people have to temper their expectations mm-hmm. and understand that if Adam Fox gets 25 points this year, that's a good rookie season. It's not like he's going to be a 45-point guy, in my opinion, as a rookie. Mm. The next question is from Billy Puck follower. And Billy Puck <laughs> says, Who would win a round-robin-style tournament between the Senators, Kings, Ducks, Sabres, Blue Jackets, and Oilers? And I do think the wow. joke here is supposed to be that these teams are all bad. Right. And I think that's what Billy Puck is saying. And yeah, I agree with you, Billy Puck. Billy Puck follower. Yeah, Billy Puck follower. Mm. Uh, Shouldn't follow the Puck. So we, <laughs> Shouldn't follow the Puck. You yeah, go where it's going to be. Don't that's follow right. it. Don Cherry says, Tell you right now, don't follow the Puck. <laughs> okay, uh... So let's make our picks for this this basement <laughs> dweller tournament. Who yeah. you got? Who you got? I like it, I like it. I'm gonna go with the Edmonton Oilers because they have the best player the in best Connor two McDavid. The, the best, best two, two players, players, really. Yeah, they yeah. got Leon Draisaitl as well. Yeah. And yeah, I guess that out of that pool of teams, those are the two best players. Um, I, I can see Edmonton getting hot. In a tournament like this, they're the type of team. Well, no, but they're the type of team that you can (laughs) ride with David and Drysdale. You know, I mean, you look at the defenses they're going to be facing here, and I mean, Columbus will have a good defense, but otherwise, I think most of these teams are pretty porous. So I think just riding McDavid and Drysdale would be enough to win the basement tournament. Yeah, I'm I'm still going to go with the Blue Jackets. I, I don't think, I don't. I, I don't buy into the doom and gloom that a lot of other people have. I think they're still going to be good. I don't think they're going to be great, but I think they're going to be good. Yeah. Um, you know, they've got a good basis there. They've got they've got they've got Seth Jones. They've got an elite elite defense core. Yeah, an, an NHL elite defense core, and I think that is good enough to make you a, at least a decent team. And and to me, I look at all these teams and. I don't see any decent teams other than the Blue Jackets. Mm. Maybe Anaheim. Um, you know, this time last year I would have said no. Like they're probably not even going to be able to, you know, put a roster together. Right. But I, I think now you've got a, a bunch of young guys, and those guys will all be hungry. You know, you've got Max Jones, Max Contois, you've got Troy Terry, you've got uh, who else? Sam Steele. Yeah. You know, so those guys are going to be, you know, especially in a short. Five game thing, they would mm. they'd have a lot of energy and they, they you know they might they might really bring it. So mm-hmm. I would say Columbus or, or Anaheim. I think Columbus was probably my top pick just because they can play discipline style to physical style under John Tortorella. Assuming their goaltending holds up with with Corpusalo and Merzlikens, I think that Columbus is going to be fine defensively this year. So they can win a yeah. lot of two one games right. in this war of attrition tournament. <laughs> uh, but my other sleeper team, and it's easy to win two one games in yes. this tournament. Of course, right. nobody's, <laughs> nobody's getting Barnburners. Yeah. It might be Barnburners. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
But my sleeper team is a team whose new coach is a master of the short tournament. Ah, Ralph yeah. Kruger, nice. the Buffalo Whoa. Sabres. Uh-huh. So you just you just ride Rasmus Dahlin and play him for 30 minutes every game in the, in the little round robin tourney. Yeah. And maybe you double shift Jack Eichel. I don't know. Uh-huh. Uh, I think talent wise, at least Buffalo maybe can compete with Edmonton the best in terms They're of top end talent on the yeah. roster. Uh, you know, Jeff Skinner and Eichel. Guys like that. Uh, so I'll say Sabres are the sleeper. Maybe the final is Columbus Buffalo. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, wow. <laughs> wow. Get your tickets I think I now. just yawned. I think I yawned saying <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, so the next question is from what might be a robot, Benmo 2.0. Mm. Asks, Give it the Turing test. Yeah, Benmo 9000 asks, <clears throat> who retires first, Alex Ovechkin or Sidney Crosby? I feel confident about my answer for this one. This I, I great, thought I was confident, yeah. and then I was like, Ugh, I don't know. It's a good question. question. It's the best question yeah. of, the, of the lot. In great, the great job, question robot. Yeah, yes. way to go. No, this is an amazing question. Mm. Um, because they're both going to play until it gets ugly. Right. They're both going to play until it gets ugly. Until they lock yeah, the rink yeah, behind them. Yeah, and and so um, I, I, I'm... I mean, Sid's under contract longer, but I don't think that's going to be that big a deal. I, I'm going to go with Ovechkin only because, for a couple of reasons, he's been, he's yeah. I mean, the numbers tell us he's been more durable. He's mm-hmm. played almost 100 more career games mm-hmm. than Crosby has to this point, and they both started in the same year. Um, so there's that, and I just don't think I think it's going to be easier for Alex Ovechkin to hide and to just be a power play specialist and to you know bo- you know get that bomb on the power play and and not like and, but he's he's obviously a very physical player and yeah. and as of them winning the cup he's a much more engaged player yeah. so that's going to wear him down uh, but but I think he's going to he's going to be able to afford and going to be more inclined to pick his spots as yep. his career goes on and so he can kind of he'll kind of be able to hide a little bit Crosby that's that he won't he just won't he'll he'll play hard every shift until the last one of his career and that combined with I think you know a little less durability I think might might mean that he'll he'll have the shorter mm-hmm. the shorter leash the, the shorter tenure mm. so wait are you saying Crosby I'm saying well, who, who retires first? Or yeah, is it, yeah retires. I'm saying I'm saying Crosby will Crosby retire retires. first. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm going with Ovechkin, and it only comes down to one factor because I was trying to think like, oh well, you know, Ovechkin's got his cup and he likes to party and everything, but it's like, yeah, but he also really likes to play hockey. Yeah, just like I said, I, I don't think you can make a distinction in terms of their competitiveness or their or their want to be there. Both the guys, they just want to play, they want to win, they love the game. So I'm going to go with the fact that Ovi has a bigger frame. He carries Mm -hmm. more weight, Mm -hmm. and that has been a benefit for him up to now and Mm -hmm. will probably still be a benefit to him for the next couple of years. But eventually, I think that's going to wear on him. It's going to be hard to carry that when he gets into his late 30s. Uh, So because of that, I think eventually he'll have to stop. I don't know if it's going to be injuries or if it's just like he's going to slow down. Um, right, Like I say, right now it's great for him, but I think eventually it's going to catch up. Mm. And because of that, I'm going to say Ovi. But yeah, great question. Interesting. And, and what I like about it is that we all have very different reasons for our answers. So uh, I'm going to say that Crosby retires first. And for me, it's a matter of motivation. So Ovechkin, if he keeps playing for another five years, is going to have a chance to challenge Wayne Gretzky's record right. all time for goals. And I remember asking uh, Ovechkin before they won the cup if that mattered to him. And he said, well, I want my cup first before I think about that. They have the cup now. Mm. He has his cup now. So I think he knows now if, if he gets – if he if – he, continues to score even if he's not scoring 50 goals if he's scoring 40 goals 40 goals then a couple 30 goal seasons if he can manage to hang in there getting close to his 40s he's gonna at least become the second 800 goal guy or, mm-hmm. or, or sorry third 800 goal guy mm-hmm. Cody Howe of course uh, and I think he's going to have a real shot whereas Crosby if you look at Crosby's numbers he's gonna retire as maybe a top five player of all time but he's not gonna challenge a goals record an assists record a points record he's got multiple Stanley Cups and I even asked him this summer said you know you've won everything there is to win what about the Selkies out on your bucket list so but what he said to me was he said yeah but Patrice Bergeron's gonna be on the ballot every year that's so basically there's only two spots up for grabs and he wasn't a finalist that year right right right. so he says in his mind because of Bergeron's presence that he feels like there literally are just two places available mm. every year, so he's mm-hmm. not overly optimistic that he can even win that. Uh, and I think that Crosby, because he's had the more 
sort of dangerous injury past. As he gets older, if something happens to him again, I think he's more likely to say, you know what, I need to walk away to be to be safe. Yeah. Whereas Ovi's been yeah. much more durable, like you said, Ken, and Ovi has that big carrot to chase, which is the mm-hmm. goals record. So, nice. great question, Robot. Very good question. Good job, yeah. Robot. Good Robot. <laughs> uh, next question is from Lee Hamilton, and Lee says, in the league where, where revenue and TV ratings are, are so dependent on large market success, why aren't ideas like a soft salary cap or luxury task tax discussed more often in that scenario the large market teams could spend more to me Mm -hmm. it's a gary bettman thing and i mean gary bettman is the parody guy he wants those even though they're smaller markets i think his goal his entire tenure has been to develop those markets and i think he prefers having as many teams as possible competitive even if it means you know you're not getting the tv ratings of dominant Kings Rangers matchups every year. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think I think because well, of Batman, it's going to stay the way it is. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure if it's because of Batman, but mm-hmm. but I mean, you look at baseball, and you know, it's a race to the bottom in a lot of cases, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I I think it's it's basically because the NHL has never had an appetite for a luxury tax. It it never wanted one. It was intent. It fought so hard to get the system that it's got right now, and it's working for them. And I, I just I, I just don't get any sense, any sense whatsoever that there's going to be any kind of luxury tax in the place of a hard cap. The hard cap is king. Yeah. It has kept the top salaries down. If you look at other sports, uh, you know, hockey's top guys are not making much more than they were making f- even 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Whereas in all, all the other three sports, the guys are making two, three, four times what they made 10 years ago, yep. 15 years ago. In hockey, it's it's relatively the same. Yeah. Like Peter Forsberg was making, what, $11 yeah, million? Yeah, dollars and Yeah, and you know, guys yep. like that. And, you know, Connor McDavid's now making 12 and a half, and John yeah. Tavares is making 11. And, and adjusted and, for inflation, yeah. today's players are less rich. Yeah. 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 In fact, in fact, I would think, and, and, and I don't know this for a fact, but I think that what's going to happen here. I think this. I, I I feel more confident that this CBA is going to get extended, and this is this is going to be taken care of than I have at any time in this process. And I think part of it is, in fact, I think they're going to. I think there may be a chance that the cap gets frozen rather than moves up, because I think that's one way. That's going to be the one way to mitigate, or one of the ways to mitigate escrow. True. And that's all it's about for the players. Right. That's all the players care about. That drives them nuts. They want it, they want to come out of this, they want to come out of these next negotiations without having to put, you know, to give up 14% of their pay or 12 to 14% of their pay, you know, a couple of percent of which they get back at the end of the year. But it's all about escrow. And I think I, I don't think it's gonna get in fact, I don't think there's gonna be more money in the system. I think there might even be less. Mm. And you know, you look at even big market teams. Uh, like the Boston Bruins, for example, and the system works for them. And we know Jeremy Jacobs is one of the most powerful owners in the league. He's one of the most powerful people in hockey. His team just went to the final. He doesn't have to spend more. He can spend to the cap, and his team can still be competitive because he's got a GM that's uh, doing the right things in Don Sweeney. You look at the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they can spend... Off the ice with coaches, right, trainers, right. scouts. You know, mm-hmm. Chicago has a big scouting department as well. They've made a lot of moves. Chicago has won three cups yeah. in the sta- in the salary cap era. Yeah. So they've made it work as a big market. Los Angeles is a big market. They've won two Stanley Cups. You know, they figured out how to put that team together. Yeah. And so, you know, for those for those owners, it's like, oh, I can make a ton of profit and still be very yeah, competitive. Yeah. yeah. I say okay. Yeah. The because they, they, they don't care. Like they don't care. They, I mean, it's the general managers and the guys that put the teams together that care. Yeah. But the owners did not give up a season and a half in lockouts in order to give it back. Right. They 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 got what they they, they did that because they wanted this system yeah. and they got this. The system. League's never been yeah. healthier financially. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. so they're not going to give that back. Nah. True. Uh, next question is from Matt Boeringer, and Matt says last year it was. Eric Carlson and Mark Stone, who are the biggest names that will be moved going forward to the trade deadline and where could they go? So maybe I'll start here because I, I wrote about this recently. 
made a big old list. Big old um, list. Chris mm. Kreider's a name to watch, but I, I think Chris Kreider is more likely to be moved before the season starts because the <laughs> Rangers have a million dollars in cap space. They have no obvious candidate for LTIR. They have to re-sign still Brendan Lemieux and Tony D'Angelo. So, like, there's been talk of can Kreider, like, they're going to have to trade him no matter what before the season starts because they don't have the money to mm. field their entire roster right now. So he's a name to watch, but I don't, I don't count him because I think he could be gone before the trade deadline. If we're talking trade deadline, it's going to be very interesting to watch what Bill Guerin does because uh, Jared Spurgeon, I know it was reported before, I think it was Mike Russo that reported of The Athletic, that he expressed interest in an extension if he respected the team's vision. And so maybe he's going to sit down with Bill Guerin and get a better sense that you know Bill Guerin wants to build the team a certain way and that it'll appeal to Spurgeon and Spurgeon wants to sign. But the other factor at play is maybe Bill Guerin looks at this roster and says, no, it's not about making my, the team competitive right now. We have to go backward to go forward. Mm-hmm. And that might mean trading Jared Spurgeon because as a right shot, puck mover, very underrated defensively, he could command a king's ransom at the trade deadline. Yep. Any team any team could use Jared Spurgeon. Very underrated player. Mm-hmm. And he's going to bring in a first-round pick and a good prospect. We know the Wild, that they really need help to spruce up their farm system again. So I think he's a guy that if I have to bet right now, is he going to be part of the Wild or get traded? I don't know. I think Bill Guerin coming in, like if you're going to come in and do the same old thing, then why do they fire Paul Fenton? Right. right. If you're, co- I right. think it makes sense for the, the wild comments. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but if you're coming in, I think you got to be blowing it up and doing something drastic because yeah. the, the the organization is saying what well, what we've done is not working. We can't be in this murky Need to middle. reset. Need to reset. Yeah. So it starts with trading your best expiring asset, Jared Spurgeon. Yep. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, you could go with somebody who's going to be an RFA or UFA this summer. Um, like a Robin Laner maybe uh, in Chicago if mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. you know go south there. Um, but I I, I'm, I wanted to look two years ahead to guys because then you can trade them and they still have a year left on that contract. Generally, a lot of those guys don't end up getting traded at the trade deadline. Sometimes. But you know, I look at a guy like Dougie Hamilton. I mean. Mm-hmm. Because Dougie Hamilton, it doesn't need to be, <laughs> nothing else needs to be said, right? Because that's what he does. He gets traded. So he goes to some museums. There's see, a guy. Yeah. Gets yeah. Traded. Okay. There's a guy. And an- another guy, you know, and I'm not for one second saying he's going to get traded, but you may look at a guy like Ryan Nugent Hopkins, yeah. who will have a year left after this year, um, you know, because, because then if you do decide to pull the trigger on that trade, and you do decide that you you know you need the help on defense, you need the help in goal or whatever, and he's he's an asset that you have too much of already. You know you can you can get more for him with a year left on his contract than you can if his if his, if his contract's expiring. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go with a big spicy name here, Taylor Hall <gasps> in yeah, New Jersey. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, pending UFA in the summer. Uh, we think the Devils are going to be really fun this year, you know, with Jack Hughes and P.K. Subban and Wayne Simmons coming in and Nikita Gusev as well. Um, but what if they struggle, you know? Um, and you have to look at asset management. If Taylor Hall was going to go to market in the summer and you're GM Ray Shiro, do you say to yourself, okay, well, what can I get for Taylor Hall at the deadline? Because he would be one of the most potent assets available yeah. by far. You could get a mint for Taylor Hall yeah, he's right gotta, now. Yeah, he's got to stay healthy. He's got to stay healthy. And, and I think you got to trade him way before the deadline. Yeah, I, I, I can think, see I, that. I think, you know, and, but we're saying by the deadline. I, right. But, but this isn't a trade you're going to make on February you know, 17th. Yeah. This is a trade you're going to make on November 12th. If you're, if you're, <laughs> if, you know, if, if you're like if toast. You're struggling, yeah, if you're, yeah. If you're out of it. If yeah. you're toast. And a couple of teams that I was thinking of were uh, like Nashville or Colorado. Teams that are looking pretty good right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously Nashville and New Jersey are familiar trade partners. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, teams that are pretty good right now, we think they're going to be contenders, but they could definitely use an elite winger. I mean, who couldn't? But right, those teams right. in particular, mm-hmm. and then you're trading outside of your conference. If you don't care about that thing, I think Boston would be an example as well. Where if you had Taylor Hall on your second line, oh my, yeah. like that would that <laughs> oh would give my. that would give teams fits. <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, I, I mean, if things go well in New Jersey, then obviously you hang on to Taylor Hall. Even if you're in the mix, I think you hang on to him. But if things go pear-shaped right Right, away, then I think you have to at least look at it before you potentially lose him for nothing in the summer. Yeah, because John Tavares a couple years ago is the cautionary tale. We don't want to be that team that's, you know, we're committed to keeping him and then he decides to leave in the summer, you get Mm -hmm. nothing for him. And players have paid attention to that. They have definitely studied what Tavares has done and said, 
There's no reason not to do your research and be patient and go to free agency. You can always re-sign with your team like Steven Stamkos did in Tampa Bay, or you can go elsewhere. What's mm-hmm. going to be interesting is Austin Matthews just signed a five-year deal, right? So I've always, I've kind of, I kind of started thinking about this. He could very well pull a Tavares. Oh, yeah. An exact to them, like exactly uh, at the sure. He leaves after the five years to go home, to go play in Arizona. Yeah, there's Arizona. Arizona. Go play in Arizona, and then Leaf fans will know exactly. And then Le- and the Leaf fans, if that happens, you cannot burn Matthews jerseys no, because you, nope. you were happy when Tavares came back. So yep. you can't you can't do what the Islanders fans did because then you're hypocrites. Okay, <laughs> Leaf Nation. Uh, it's funny because that's like a, a, a phantom five years from now scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the last question is from Neil McDonald, and Neil asks, will there be an RFA to set out the entire season? Uh, and then there's a part, a second part of the question, and become a UFA July 1st, which we believe is not accurate. It's not. Yes, because you were it's, doing some homework on it, Kenny, it's so maybe yeah, you, you answered first. No, then. no, he, no. I mean, RFAs, you, you know, I mean, they're not, they're, the guys coming off of entry level, they don't become free agents just because they sat out a year. Mm-hmm. In fact, they would, yeah. they, they I, I, I think... I'm not sure if they would still owe that year. I mean, they don't owe the year on the contract. If you're arbitration because they, they don't have a contract, but yeah. they may still owe that year in terms of their whether or not they can go to arbitration yeah. and, and that sort of thing. You can and, sign a one year deal. Like agency. Mark Stone yeah. is the closest. Yeah. One year deal in arbitration that takes right. you to UFA. Right, but exactly. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I don't. I don't think that's going to happen. I, th- I think that. I, I mean, it looks dire right now because none of them have signed, right. and they all seem to be waiting for the the shoe to drop, but. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I talked to Doug Armstrong about this a couple of years ago at uh, in Traverse City, yeah. where you're going, going for, the, for the rookie tournament. And I think it was Jaden Schwartz and somebody else who were who were coming off entry level. And he said, he he was like, I'm really not this that worried about it because in the end, what's a player going to do? Is he is he not going to play and not yeah. get paid at all? It, like it doesn't during happen. the prime years of their career. Like, like how often does that happen? That a guy yeah. sits out a year. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think Brandon Witt did it, and you know, a few other guys have done it, and they've gone to play elsewhere. But Peter Nedved, speaking, I think. Peter yeah, Nedved? but yeah. again, that's like generally speaking, decades ago. they yeah. want it. They want to be playing in the NHL. Yeah. They know that if they sit out an entire year, it's going to be really like almost impossible to get that money back. So I think they will all get signed at some point. Um, when I I don't assume it's going to be any time in the very near future. Um, but I think they'll all sign. And, and nobody, I mean, these guys can't become unrestricted free agents, mm-hmm. so yeah. it's not a worry. And, and I agree. I, I don't think it's going to happen because they have their cautionary tale in William Nylander. Like, I'm sure if any of those guys were like, hey, was it worth it, you know, staying out until December 1st or like just yeah. before December yeah. 1st? Nylander would be like, no, yeah. no, <laughs> it's Yeah, it yeah. didn't go well at all. No, it, and it doesn't generally. It doesn't. It's a hard it league. Doesn't. You just can't take you, that time that off. At that age, and it, but at that age and at that point in your development, you yeah. it, you know it's it's imperative for you to be in camp yeah. on day one. And none of these guys are going to be in camp on day one. Okay, yeah, like they're, they're not going to take out insurance and come as 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 free agents in camp. Mm. That's not going to happen. Uh, so a lot of them are going to miss camp. Some of them will miss part of the season. And those that do. Um, it, you know, and, and I'm not making any judgment here whatsoever. You no. sign for what you think yeah, they're yeah, worth, totally. and you sit out until you get that. But yeah. it's going to hurt them. Yeah, it's going to hurt them. It's going to take them a while to get the, themselves up to speed at the NHL level. It happens all the time, and it will happen with these guys as good as they are. Mm-hmm. I think if I had to pick someone just for the sake of the exercise, I, I mean, I've said it all along. It, Line is the guy I've been the most worried about. Yeah. Uh, so you never know. Does he go back to Finland? I, I don't think so, though. I really don't. So that's it for this week, everybody. Next up, next time you hear us, we'll be previewing the divisions one by one. We're going to do a podcast for each division. Hockey is almost here. It's exciting. Thanks for listening.